Hello, welcome to our overview of Baroque art in Europe. The Baroque movement continued the illusionism begun by the artists of the Renaissance, but added more intensity through drama, both in content and in style. Covering the 17th century, the Baroque era was a time of major religious and political change as church officials and regional authorities rewrote the norms in the wake of the Protestant Reformation and the Catholic Counter-Reformation that responded to it. Our map here shows Europe in the 17th century, with the major Catholic kingdoms of Portugal, Spain, and France allied with the Papal States and many other republics in the Italian peninsula, contending the newly Protestant lands throughout the Holy Roman Empire and the newly independent Dutch Republic. As the forces of Protestantism and Catholicism waged war against each other, both in word and action, the role of art in religion was also hotly debated. In general, the Protestants saw art as a lavish distraction from the act of worship, no longer needed to serve in either instructive or decorative capacities since salvation was accomplished by faith alone without the church hierarchy. However, Catholics contended that art was a vital part of religious worship, especially for those who could not read the scriptures themselves. Thus, we see two very different interpretations of religious art throughout the 17th century, and we see a parallel rise in secular art, such as landscapes and group portraits as a result. In addition to the tumultuous religious and political environment, the 17th century was also a time of exploration and discovery. Nations like Britain, Spain, Portugal, and France had established successful colonies in the Americas, paving the way for transatlantic travel, commerce, and exchange. Meanwhile, discoveries in the fields of astronomy, botany, optics, physics, and more helped explain the phenomena of the natural world and demysticize occurrences that had once been interpreted through the lens of superstition or as acts of God. Artists absorbed these discoveries and amplified their implications in their works, especially in painting. A greater emphasis on the nature of light is evident as is more attention to dramatic movements of human figures, theatrical compositions that turn viewers into spectators, and the selection of climactic narrative moments that center on suspense and emotional intensity. We begin with a familiar character, David, sculpted by the great John Lorenzo Bernini, one of the Baroque masters working in Rome. Though it is made of marble, Bernini's version of David is very different from Michelangelo's in several ways. Rather than portraying David in deep thought, providing an opportunity to see the intellectual prowess that accompanied the physicality, Bernini gives us David in action. We still see muscular definition, but that is because the muscles are tensed and engaged as he twists in preparation of releasing the rock from his sling. At life size, Bernini's David doesn't tower over the viewer, giving viewers an opportunity to look directly at David and scrutinize the effort and determination shown through his facial expression. This is the essence of counter-reformation Baroque art, seizing the attention of the viewer through narrative intensity and physical immediacy. If Bernini was one of the greatest Baroque sculptors in Rome, Caravaggio was undoubtedly one of the greatest painters. He created paintings that looked like frozen moments in a theatrical production, often made for churches in Rome that sought to recapture the hearts and attention of followers who may have been tempted to doubt the relevance or integrity of the Catholic Church in the wake of the Reformation. Caravaggio's painting here, called Entombment, was intended for a smaller chapel within one of Rome's churches. It depicts the moment when the dead body of Jesus has been lowered from the cross and is now being placed in a tomb. The two men struggle to hold up the dead weight of Jesus, while the women openly mourn and wail behind them. 
they are crowded together on a platform above the eye level of the viewer, as if placed on a stage facing the direction of the audience. Caravaggio's use of chiaroscuro adds to the realism, making the textures of the clothing, flesh, wooden platform, and green plant all seem distinct. Though Caravaggio employs linear perspective to draw our eyes to the focal point in the center of the canvas, there is no atmospheric perspective at all. Instead, Caravaggio uses tenebrism, an extreme contrast between light and dark, by completely obscuring the background and highlighting the figures in the foreground. By giving us a suspended moment in a series of movements, gestures, and other physical actions, Caravaggio keeps us engaged as we fill in the narrative moments before and after in our own minds. Another accomplished artist of Baroque Italy was Artemisia Gentileschi. Gentileschi's father was also a painter and oversaw her artistic training. Schooled in the techniques of perspective and skilled in the use of oil paint to achieve more realistic modeling and shading, Gentileschi created artworks that were just as astounding as any male artists of her time. Unfortunately, when Gentileschi was only 17 years old, she was brutally raped by an artist colleague of her father and was forced to recount the traumatic experience in a public trial of her attacker. When her attacker, Agostino Tazzi, refused to marry her, which was the expected outcome of such horrific acts at the time, her father pressed charges and he was found guilty but never really punished. Gentileschi, for her part, struggled to gain the kind of acclaimed fame she deserved, but certainly didn't struggle in producing mesmerizing paintings after her trauma. She painted several versions of Judith beheading Holofernes, a biblical tale of a widow saving her town from siege by a foreign military through deceiving the general and murdering him when he was too drunk to resist. In this painting, Gentileschi doesn't shy away from showing the gruesome murder, complete with blood splatter and the tortured expression of Holofernes. Judith displays calm determination and physical dominance, and her maidservant assists by holding down the enormous man. The lines created by the arms of Judith, Holofernes, and the maidservant, as well as the lines created by the torso and legs of Holofernes on the left side of the canvas, all draw our eyes back to the center of the canvas, forcing us to confront the fatal blow over and over again. Interpreted by many as a scene of female empowerment, Jen Teleski's portrait gives viewers an arresting image that demonstrates the lengths that a woman will go in the protection of what she prizes most. Believed to be a slightly later version of the same story, Jen Teleski's painting here gives us a very different effect. There is no sign of the violence of the previous image, as we sneak a look at Judith and her maidservant calculating what to do now that the murderous decapitation is complete. Gentileschi uses light in a beautifully dramatic way, highlighting the richness of Judith's gown and the intense concentration written on her face. Judith and her maidservant are the focus here, and we are invited to wonder what the women will do now, knowing what they've already done. The head of Holofernes is almost an afterthought, relegated to the very bottom of the canvas and completely devoid of any of the power and dominance this man once enjoyed. Though Gentileschi allows the tenebrism of the scene to make Judas stand out from the background, she includes important lines and colors to help draw our attention back to her in the center, from the diagonals created in the body and clothing of the maidservant and the swooping red curtain at the right, to the table and candle at the left. Both versions, however, reinforce the mes message of strength under pressure, showing one woman leading another to rescue herself from the threat of male danger. In Northern Europe, though many regions in the Holy Roman Empire and the Dutch Republic became Protestant, the region of Flanders, now Belgium, 
was still part of the Spanish Empire and remained Catholic. Rubens, working in Flanders and other Spanish-held territories in the 17th century, continued to paint monumental works of religious subject matter. This triptych was an altarpiece for the Antwerp Cathedral, and it was enormous. An altarpiece of this size would have given believers in the congregation something to view during services, and Rubens did not waste this opportunity to captivate his audience. The central panel is the main drama, showing the elevation of Jesus on the cross, and everything about this panel shows energy and struggle. The dramatic diagonal arrangement of the figures alongside the cross implies movement, emphasized by the muscular definition of the male bodies leaning one way and the other, pulling and lifting with all their might. The panel on the left side shows a horrified mother reeling backwards with her child in the foreground as the solemn Mary and St. John look on from further away. On the right panel, we see the Roman soldiers on horseback leading the other prisoners to their gruesome fates as well. An angry sky hovers over them. The viewer is uncomfortably implicated in this image as the action seems to unfold right before our eyes. So close we could almost hear the grunts and screams and smell the blood and sweat. Like Caravaggio and Gentileschi, Rubens sought to dramatize his paintings and create a theatrical spectacle for viewers but did so by exaggerating the physical and emotional characteristics of everyone involved. We conclude with a very different kind of Baroque painting. The Dutch Republic gained its independence from Spain in the mid 17th century after decades of fighting. Protestantism was widely adopted in this region and religious paintings were less favorable. Artists like Rembrandt found their success in painting portraits especially group portraits, that helped create a new visual landscape in cities like Amsterdam. Rather than being surrounded by images of Jesus and Mary, residents of Amsterdam were surrounded by images of themselves. Professional guilds celebrated their prestige and membership by commissioning monumental group portraits to hang in their meeting halls, demonstrated the important contributions they offered to this prosperous city. Here we see one such group, a militia charged with protecting the city against outside threats. The men who belonged to this militia, identified formally as the company of Captain Franz Bonnenkoch, swore to defend the city and its residents and were ready to assemble at a moment's notice. The scene is one such moment as men grab spears and muskets brandish swords and even drum and shout as they rally to defend their city. The captain strides forward in the center of the scene, giving orders as the noisy collection of militiamen assemble around him. These individuals were real members of the community and could be identified by their likenesses painted in naturalistic detail by Rembrandt, giving them a sense of pride that their portrait now graced the walls of such a prominent location. The only fictional member is the little girl to the left of Captain Koch, who is the golden allegorical embodiment of the militia itself. She strides into the middle of the group without hesitation, holding the gaze of the viewer and bearing an upside down chicken hanging from her belt, a reference to the talon that served as a symbol or logo of the militia. Artists like Rembrandt use the techniques of chiaroscuro and tenebrism to direct our attention throughout the image, creating an action-packed scene of regular citizens who now were worthy of being subjects in monumental painting. This concludes our brief overview of Baroque art in Europe.